Hey guys, I'm going to give it a minute uh, for me to get a sound check. So if someone can just let me know when you hear me, that would be fantastic. Can you hear me? Excellent. Okay. All right. Let's just jump right in. Okay. So I will share my screen. All right. So tonight we are, whoops, just a second. Ah. Tonight, we are going to talk about malachite, and we're going to take a pretty deep dive into this topic. Excuse me. I've been following this topic and taking notes on this topic um, for a little more than a couple years now because it just seemed to keep popping up as a scarlet thread throughout this story. So what I did in this live is I just compiled all of the references that I've been keeping, and we're just going to go through those. But it really seems throughout this story that Lori in particular was obsessed with malachite. So we're going to explore what that looked like, what is malachite, um, and um, and the references to it in the FOIA docs, and then we'll just see where it goes from there. Okay, this live, none of these lives are an opportunity to talk about the Facebook group. In fact, the Facebook group has become such a distraction during the lives and throughout the comments. Uh, I just made the decision to set the Facebook group to hidden. I'm really not very active in it anyway. Um, I pop in there from time to time, usually when I'm researching a topic, um, but it's just not a very active group. It might pick up when uh, the case um, comes around or when the trial comes around, I should say. Uh, but you know, if Facebook ever updated its policy on sock puppet accounts, those are just like fake accounts, um, we would open up the group again. Until that happens and unless that happens, I really don't think we're going to reopen the group because it's just such a time suck. And anytime uh, Janice and I in particular have gone through all of the requests, uh, you know, roughly 80 to 90% of them are pretty clearly sock puppets. And, um, and the rest, you know, people take umbrage at having to verify their account and things like that. And it's just not worth the hassle. Okay. I always make a hat tip to this. Uh, I have this, um, uh, this out there, you know, just, uh, I am pushing for Phoenix police to investigate Joe's death. Um, if you would like to sign the petition, you can go to bit.ly justice for Joe. Justice just has the vows taken out. Also, we're going to be back in rotation on the live Q and A. So we have those on the off Friday. So we have um, a topical live every other week and a Q and A on the off weeks. And as a pro tip, uh, ask your question early. In fact, I mean, as soon as I post the live, you can go in there and ask your questions. Um, and anyway, it's a good time. There are lots of really good questions that are asked. Okay, all right, let's jump in. What is malachite? Um, hmm, this might be a problem. Actually, I'm going to disconnect my AirPods. I'm missing a part to my microphone, but I'm going to need to disconnect my AirPods uh, because you won't be able to hear the video.
Okay, sorry about that. I didn't realize that the mute button had been uh, clicked. All right, so um, if you could uh, let me know when you hear me, we will jump back in. Can you hear me? Okay, great. <clears throat> so I just said, I wanna start with this article um, about Malachite uh, because it, I'm not going to read the whole thing, uh, but the first paragraph, the guy was just talking about how, you know, he wanted to get into working with rocks and um, all these lovely rocks I had dusted after, excuse me, lusted after for so long were finally put under my polishing wheel, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay. But I soon began to experience a nasty and completely unexpected cavalcade of health problems. Coughing. Okay. Uh, oh, I saw sad emojis and thought you couldn't hear me again. All right. But I soon began to experience a nasty and completely unexpected cavalcade of health problems. Coughing, hoarseness, difficulty clearing my throat, breathlessness, and a dull ache in the pit of my lungs. Of course, I had always worn safety glasses with side protection as recommended in every manual, but a mask seemed a cumbersome hindrance. As the situation worsened, I tried several dust masks, but there was little improvement. It was time to do a little research. So I hit the books and started talking to fellow rock hounds. It was a revelation. Rock dust from lapidary work turns out to be more than just a nuisance. It can be deadly. A single heavy dose can cause crippling lifelong problems. It attacks the lungs in a variety of ways. First, by coating the inner lining and blocking the transmission of oxygen. So take a mental note of that. It blocks the, transmis the transmission of oxygen into the bloodstream. Second, tiny sharp fragments slice and cut into the alveoli, which coat the inner lining of the lungs, causing irritation and inflammation. Fresh dust seems to be harmful because the sharp edges have not had a chance to be softened by moisture. Some, some forms of rock dust are quite poisonous in and of themselves, whether it is inhaled, ingested, ingested, excuse me, or contacted by exposed skin, the effect can be injurious to your health. Among the worst offenders are minerals containing copper oxide. Make a mental note of copper oxide that will come up again in the upcoming videos. <clears throat> excuse me. The higher oxide of copper, which can cause the damage, uh, which can cause damage to the endocrine and central nervous systems. These minerals include some of our most colorful and treasured semi-precious stones, turquoise, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and malachite. These percentages are only close approximations. Each rock has its own signature of impurities. It is worth remembering that other closely related copper count compounds are highly bioactive and have been used in pesticides, fungicides, and wood preservatives for decades. This is dangerous material. These high copper rocks should not be licked to bring out the color and oil mixed with the dust should be carefully cleaned off exposed skin. Several lapidaries who, who smoke have described, uh, I think that, hmm, have described their own novel test for overexposure. Apparently copper impregnated dust combines with nicotine and, not, and tobacco tar in saliva to form a sickeningly sweet compound similar to saccharin. When their mouths start to taste like a candy factory, these rock hounds know it's time to quit. Another sign is influenza type symptoms. Symptoms of copper oxide dust poisoning mimic the flu, causing headaches, coughing, sweating, sore throat, nausea, and fever. Skin, eye, and respiratory tract irritation are also among are, are also common, along with a distinct metallic taste. A common name for these health effects is metal fume fever. Um, and yeah, this is the last paragraph, <clears throat> excuse me. 
In fact, when you get right down to it, almost all the rocks most favored by cutters and polishers contain compounds that can be dangerous when inhaled. Uh, silicates are the most common family of minerals on earth and silicosis has long been one of the chief hazards facing stonemasons. The ancient Greeks and Romans were the first to observe its ravages and correctly associated the problem with mining and rock work. Similar to the black lung disease of coal miners, it came to be known in later years as grinders composition, I mean consumption, excuse me. The simple steps taken to prevent it were a major achievement in the modern field of occupational health. Ironically, although silicosis is well understood today, thousands still die from its effect every year, mainly from mining and sandblasting in the third world. The symptoms of inhaling crystalline silica dust include shortness of breath, cough, fever, emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, tuck that away, lung scarring, and increased susceptibility to tuberculosis and cancer. Silicosis often takes many years to develop from repeated exposure to low doses of dust, but once established, it is irreversible. <clears throat> and I have the link to this if you want to read the rest of the article. Okay, so one of my absolute favorite people who has been interviewed uh, multiple times by Profiling Evil is Dr. Amy Salerno. And she talked in a few different uh, podcasts. This was her earliest one that, that she did. This was um, when Chris McDonough was uh, still on the um, Profiling Evil team. And I'm just going to play these videos. Hopefully you won't have a problem hearing them. So what would cause the um, foam in the mouth that you were talking about? And now if we're looking at an autopsy after the body's exhumed, how, how difficult is that going to be to do toxicology? Yeah, that's going to be difficult. And it's also going to be difficult to, I mean, I'm assuming she was embalmed. And that makes it difficult to really get a, a fresh look at what was going on. Generally, with the foaming at the mouth, one you know one can think of seizure. One could think of then we get into some of the poisons or toxicology kind of things that cause. By the way, they're talking about Tammy in this segment. Um, <laughs> frothing at the mouth, um, which the frothing comes from. Um, lung inflammation and what we call bronchorrhea. So like diarrhea is, you know, loose stool mm -hmm. and a lot of liquid. Bronchorrhea is the extra flow and extra production of fluid and salivation in the lung. And that could come from uh, congestive heart failure. But somebody who's running and prepping for a 5K couldn't do it with congestive heart failure. And that would sort of bring us to well, what would things acutely cause? And, th and then that's where you might get into some of the toxins or the poisons. And one thing that I gleaned from the statement of Ian Pulaski that then went to B Brandon Boudreau and to the police, and it's, it, 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 it is for public consumption, is, um, I want to see if I can find the quote here is the importance of malachite in their, I'm gonna call it group. I don't wanna call it a cult yet because I don't wanna miss, I don't wanna misnomer. But what he said was, do you mind if I read this? The court, the, the court documents, the legal documents of Brandon Boudreau taken, obtained from the new husband of Melanie Pulaski state that Chad and Lori's group use, quote, healing malachite solutions and bombs. They believe that malachite has healing properties and it's used for blessings and rituals. There are th really four ways that malachite can be given to people and can be lethal. And one is in elixirs, which they mentioned the other is a bomb and so um what you do is you take the dust of the malachite 
and you mix it with oil, right? And then you can spread it on people's skin. Do not ever, ever mix crystalline malachite with oil to make a bomb because it's absorbed into the skin and it can be lethal. So Mike kind of cut her off. Um, I did. I don't think he realized that she still had two more ways, but she mentioned in one of the videos that she did that even putting malachite in uh, like a, a lotion or having it um, like sitting on a bathroom counter in something, just even the heat and moisture of a shower can activate the malachite, um, causing it to adhere um, to the alveoli and um, can cause poisoning. All right, so she dives into it a little bit more. In, so what would oops, cause? In the next slide. <clears throat> This was another, um, so I think she did three different lives um, with Profiling Evil. So this was another one that um, she did where she talked about this. It bothered me for many reasons. Number one, um, I do know that the autopsy, and it was a... Oh, and now she's talking about... Alex's autopsy. Very complete, uh, for the most part, autopsy did show that his uh, uh, left in anterior descending artery, which is the main artery that feeds your heart, was almost 100% occluded. People do die of that. Um, and he had 50% occlusion elsewhere. But what bothers me... That's just blockage. ...is that, I mean, the guy was on no medication. And only... After the fact, did Sulema say that he was symptomatic and having some maybe chest pain and some shortness of breath, but a few days prior to his death. But this is a guy who basically was traveling head and feather young. And yes, they claimed that he had um, uh, clots in his lungs, probably from maybe a deep venous thrombosis or maybe from the heart. But what bothered me about the autopsy is they really didn't comment too much on the on the deep veins of the extremity. So where did the clots come from? And then I ran with you on the whole malachite thing and that malachite can alter. I mean, it takes a small amount, like if you, uh, it, it takes a small amount, I won't tell you too much about that, but um, there was a three-year-old that, that ingested that green fish. Oh, fish food dye, I mean, fish food. I don't know if it's the food or the 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 aquatic. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Or whatever. I think it's called green malachite. And she, it was a small amount, and within minutes, her parent found her completely blue, not breathing. They rushed her down to the hospital. She survived, but they said um, the brother said, "Oh, she was eating this thing. What this thing was the the aquatic." preparation to clean the tank and it comes in a very small little bottle malachite is the main thing so it it is it is very organically active it binds to copper and you can have effects either immediately you can also have effects over a period of weeks or you can have an effect long term if you were working as a jeweler with malachite what is my point my point is that the circumstances around his death make no sense to me. The, the foaming at the mouth, the fact that he did have bowel incontinence, but that it was that it was uh, really diarrhea more than just because people do die on the commode when they strain. Uh, older people like me, if you strain, you can have a vasovagal episode and you can faint, and it can also cause your heart to, to stop, okay? So we, that's why so many older people are found on the bathroom floor. But his presentation of being on the bathroom floor 
doesn't smack of the typical vasovagal slash sudden cardiac death. All right, and I think it had bothered me. It had bothered me for many reasons. No. And more. So that was my question, Amy, is, is, um, were these. She just picks this back up. They kind of get on to another topic and then they pick it back up. So that was my question, Amy, is, is, um, were these new clots or old clots? Because yeah. an old clot would be like, I've been sitting in the airplane too long or something, wouldn't it? Well, a, a lot of people throw clot. Can, a lot of people do present. And again, by way of reminder, she's talking about Alex. With a, a culmination of, after many weeks of throwing little, little clots from a chronic um, deep venous thrombosis. Maybe they took the airplane or he went to Mexico as a truck driver to get some medications, which apparently he is on no medication. I mean, this whole story is... That is key. So she points out that Zulema said that Alex went to Mexico to get medication, but according to the autopsy, he wasn't on any medications. Very suspect. But let's say he developed a clot as a... Okay, I'm just going to... Whoops. It bothered me for many oh. reasons. It feeds your heart. It was almost 100% occluded. People do die of that. They really didn't comment, to, but um, there was a three-year-old that, that in you know, what this thing was, the, the aquatic preparation to, if you were working as a jeweler. Uh, oh, whoops. It moved to a previous slide. So that was my question, Amy, is clotting cascade. Next uh, go round, if you either. So we need more information. I mean, this whole story is... There we go. Well, I'm back to get to some where... medications, which apparently he is on no medication. I mean, this whole story is very suspect. But let's say he developed a clot as a truck driver when he went to Mexico to get his alleged medications. Maybe, but that was two weeks. Those, those clots, he may have flipped off clot here, clot there, clot here, clot there. And those would be when they opened up the lungs at old, you know, mature clots. We don't know. That wasn't commented on either. So one thing I will interject is the trip to Mexico was not two weeks before his death. It was five days. We need more info. We found that out when the FOIA docs came out, which was like more than a year after this live. Nation. Yeah. Oh, if, the, if law enforcement would just give us in the public side all the info we want. Okay. But Malachi poisoning on that, we can visit this on our next uh, go round if you choose yeah. to invite me. But Malachi poisoning is known to cause uh, micro bleeding in the lungs, and it does um, interfere with the clotting cascade. Okay, so that you get the bleeding, but then you can get a hyper clotting. So he could have been Malachi poisoned and developed these clots in his lungs. You see, so we need more time uh, and more information. I don't even know that you uh, pitched this the, the way I caught it, but when you even were, ta were you were talking about the, the child getting the malachite from the uh, aquarium and uh, you, you mentioned the jeweler and, and I want to tie together how intriguing it was that Lori ordered malachite rings for their special wedding in Hawaii and uh, and that jeweler is what what reminded me that, that that's another area that would be fun to talk about because you do see um, serial killers who at times will take trophies sometimes they're symbolic the memory the location sometimes they're the actual artifact and uh, I found that very interesting as well as we as we look at that. And we will dive into that um, in this live. I also talked about that a couple of years ago or last year in another live that I did. Oh my gosh, I love where this just happened to catch 
<clears throat> okay, so they did revisit the topic uh, sometime later. I think it was a year later because Dr. Salerno referenced like, you know, a year ago when we talked, et cetera, et cetera. But this will be the, I think the last video. Uh, this this is interesting. Calgary Archer uh, just threw this one up. What kind of drugs or substances uh, are common are not commonly tested for that you you think could cause a death like Tammy's and or Alex's? Well, I mean, I, I know that the the whole issue of malachite has come up, and we did discuss that uh, about a year ago, which of course nobody, myself, <laughs> remembers about malachite. But the key with I do. <laughs> Malachite poisoning is twofold. Number one is it, we're not talking about the, the rings that come from Amazon or whatever that are polished. And, you know, once Malachite is polished, it, it, it doesn't have the toxic properties that um, a more raw form of Malachite would have. Um, and Malachite becomes quite potent when it's mixed with water or oil. Okay. And um, we did note from the interview documents that, let me see if I can keep all these people correctly. Is it Ian Pulowski that married Melanie, right? Um, is it, is it a, a chat? Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, he, he did go to the police out of cons great concern for uh, a couple of days after he married Melanie, that she was coming out with a lot of stuff on zombies and blessings and Malachite, and, and in that document, it's about a five or six page document from the East Idaho News, actually, ha they have that document, I've reviewed that, is some specific information on the importance of Malachite in, um, quote, blessings, um, but that part of the blessings, it, it was a strange comment, I'd have to, to read back on it, but um, the, the- We will visit that ways that they use it are to make a bomb, B-A-L-M, um, that they would put on people's skin. And if you do, if uh, once you mix malachite with an oil or a water, aqueous matter, you activate it. And so there are known um, toxicities and deaths that have happened when people are rubbed with malachite, okay? And apparently as part of this cult, they used malachite bomb in their blessings, okay? And then the other is in teas that people, and I hate to even mention this, because somebody last week made a very good point that should we even be discussing these? <laughs> yeah. Because as he drinks his Dr. Pepper. <laughs> but I, but I actually popped the top on it. So, so even a date rape drug won't affect me here. Right, and hopefully the rat poison on top. Yeah, yeah. The warehouse washed. Okay, but seriously, um, the tea that, that if you and so this is why I'm a little bit nervous, not nervous, but uh, hesitant to give all too much specific, right? Because we don't need people to get unfinished yeah. people yeah. to get odd ideas. But it, it is a sweet flavor when you malachite mixed with water, and it could be given as a tea. Keep that in mind that it's a sweet flavor. And those deaths do come rather quickly. Okay. And so we don't know. Did did Tammy get a tea? Did she get any bomb? Did she get a blessing? I, we don't know. I'd have to kind of go back and see what sort of um, informal testimony. You know, I, th I think back, I mean, the example uh, the, that you and I talked about, and I actually looked at the case pretty closely of the little girl who actually got Malachi poisoning from the fish food. It's not fish food, I'm sorry. It's the fish that tank. Um, purifier, it's an yeah. parasitic, and it's actually Malachi green, which is a slightly different type of Malachi than in the gem. But the bottom line is, I mean, she literally, it was within like, yeah. In yeah. It was almost immediate. And had they not done something immediately, mm -hmm. she would have died. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is powerful. This is really powerful stuff. So the question, I guess, comes to me, and, and then I want to go back and talk about Tylee and, and Joshua for a moment, mm -hmm. is can you recover 
chemical res Okay, this is really, really, really important. Residue in tissue of a malachite poisoning because I'm going to rewind is, can you recover chemical residue in tissue of a malachite poisoning because what we do in the embalming process is we remove all the blood, we right. we fill the body with <laughs> preservatives. Right. I mean, gosh, that, that's a tough challenge for someone. The only thing, I, and that's why it's a darn shame that she didn't get uh, an autopsy because sometimes months later we'll, we will we'll call the lab or the coroner and say, do you have any uh, leftover? We, we just thought we'd like to run something else on this. And that's a, a darn shame. But going back to Ms. Archer, when she asked the question, uh, this is cowgirl Archer, um, about what are the unusual, I mean, you have the sort of top nine to 12 uh, substances that people are typically tested for, right? You know, you get your alcohol, your, um, your Tylenol, your cocaine, your marijuana. I mean, we can go down the list like that. Uh, nobody's gonna really be checking for malachite. Now, the malachite, the kind that are in the gem, the key is that the two key things with that in terms of poisoning is that there's an issue of a chemical reaction with copper, okay, in the malachite that actually competes with oxygen, go back to chemistry, competes with oxygen in the blood, on the red blood cells so that even though the red blood cells... Okay, <clears throat> she's talking about how malachite competes with oxygen and we saw that in the article that I read a, a snippet from. So I'm just going to rewind that a little bit because I think it's an important okay, point. That actually competes with oxygen, go back to chemistry, competes with oxygen in the blood on the re red blood cells so that even though the red blood cells are carrying oxygen, they've sort of been tossed off by the copper as best as I can explain it. Yeah. And therefore, that's why you get cyanotic so quickly. And that's why they can say, oh gosh, they, they look like they're they're oxygenating. I mean, if you look at the blood, it's red or whatever, but the only really way for malachite, as I recall, is to do a blood gas to find out is the oxygen saturation really what it is and what it should be. Because there's a competition with the copper and the oxygen. So people <laughs> aren't getting the oxygenation in their blood and they quickly die from malachite poisoning. Although you can have a slow death. Okay, so kind of drove that point into the ground. But I think that it's a really important point to understand the science of malachite. And Dr. Salerno had made the, the point that in autopsies, <clears throat> excuse me, a general autopsy is going to check for, I think she said it was like nine to 12 things like, you know, alcohol, marijuana, you know, um, steroids, things like that, but they don't check for poison. So you have to know the poison ahead of time and test the, the, um, the, the tissue or, you know, whatever, like if you're, uh, circling back to an autopsy, like with Joe, they took um, a section of I think his liver and something else, maybe his thigh or, or something like that, they could go back and, you know, test it for malachite poisoning, but I don't think it lasts that long. But anyway, so malachite poisoning or any of these precious or, or mi precious stones, minerals, they're not going to just show up in an autopsy. Okay, so now let's talk about how malachite keeps showing up in the timeline. And we're going to go through these in chronological order. And in my opinion, this first one is in some ways the most compelling because this was May 5th, 2019. So let's keep in mind at, at this point, everyone was still alive. Like Charles hadn't been, well, except for Joe, and I didn't want to go too far down the rabbit hole of Joe's death, but if you saw my either of my lives about Joe, uh, the first one I did, uh, no, yeah, uh, 
that I think this was still in my analytics channel. It is. <clears throat> and I share a link to the case playlist on my analytics channel so that you won't get like tangled up in all of the nerdy tech videos. Um, but I did a live where I, I showed like the state of Joe's bathroom counter. And one of the things that was curious to me is that it looked like he was about to dye his hair, but the bottle of dye is still full. So it's like he activated the solution, uh, but then I don't, I don't know what happened because typically you're not going to leave hair dye solution just open and activated in your bathroom because it just has a really bad smell. And besides that, you're wasting a bottle of hair dye, but, and we know that he didn't dye his hair because in his autopsy, it noted that he had gray hair um, on both his head and in his beard. Um, so clearly he had not dyed his hair, but it mixed up this solution. And so even when, and I wish I could have found Dr. Salerno's reference to how, if it's even just like in a lotion, in a bathroom and you take a hot shower, the, the malachite could be activated. <clears throat> there was also um, a curiosity of, there's a pair of women's sunglasses on the counter. And, um, and so, and they were the same style that Lori wore, you know, the big uh, brown, uh, sunglasses. So, I mean, lots of other people wear them as well. However, people would ask, well, maybe he had a girlfriend over. Well, if he had had a girlfriend over and that meant that he had a girlfriend and it would stand to reason that she would have checked in on him. But we know that he, um, it took most likely two to three weeks for his body to be found. So, you know, of course there are other possible explanations, but there were suspicious elements, particularly in his bathroom. So, you know, but I didn't want to go too far down that in, in this particular life. So, but at this point, so, you know, Joe's death aside, none of the deaths that we know are directly, you know, tied to this group, Lori, Chad, and whomever else, uh, none of them had taken place yet. So Charles died uh, July 11th. So on May 5th, Lori took a screenshot of a malachite stone. And um, and she, yeah, uh, yeah, okay. No, this isn't the one that she forwarded to someone. So she takes this uh, screenshot of this stone. Now, I think that this is particularly relevant because one, no one's dead. So in my mind, it, I, I agree with this. This would be uh, potentially showing the plans to marry as early as May of 2019. But I think it's really fascinating that it was just a stone. So it wasn't even a Malachite ring. And this was something that really just hit me like just a few months ago as I was going back through some of my notes, I was like, wait a minute. So she took a screenshot of a malachite stone. She didn't even care what the band looked like. She found this and took this screenshot. So to me, it's almost like if you were, you know, you just had this gravitational pull to a particular type of diamond and you pick out the diamond or maybe it's like an heirloom and then the band, you know, that's almost inconsequential. You just then shop for a band and you add the stone to the band. It seems like that, like the Malachite stone was the most important thing. And I think that that's also supported by the fact that and then a few months later, so this was after Charles was shot and killed by Lori's brother, Alex Cox. This is August 14th. So again, he was shot and killed on uh, July 11th. And this said this, um, okay, this number only appears as a contact in the 
Okay. Lori for style. That was one of Lori's accounts. So she had a Lolly Time account. I talked about that in another live that Lolly was a nickname that they had for Laura, according to um, some of the notes that were in one of the FOIA docs. Uh, the, that was one of it, it was in parentheses after Laura Cox's name and Laura was the Cox um, be, child who died in infancy. So I think that that is potentially very significant. Um, so this number only appears as a contact in the Lori for style account. That was Lori's main account in the Lolly time account. That was the account that Lori created after uh, Charles intercepted um, uh, communication between Lori and um, Chad. And we talked about that extensively in another live. In the Lolly Time account, there is a message from this number um, to Lori and the you know, whatever number linked to Alex Cox. The message read, it's Leilani Lee. Now, oh, all she did was uh, change the M to an L because Melanie's middle name is Lee. So this is her niece, Melanie. It's Leilani Lee. Save my number for you guys only. For the content linked, this number to Melanie, um, it, it was Boudreaux. Based on the content of the messages, Melanie was very close to Lori. Lori even sent Melanie photographs of Malachite wedding rings on 8-14-2019. This was prior to the death of Tammy Daybell and are the type of rings worn by Lori and Chan when they were married. <clears throat> so Lori finds these Malachite rings, uh, a men's... A, yeah, a men's ring and a woman's ring and sends a screenshot to Melanie. And then later that night purchased the ring. So you can see here the confirmation um, came in at 11.30 p.m. from Etsy. She ordered these on Etsy. Um, and uh, But it actually went through on August 15th, probably because it was just made so late. Um, so one FOIA doc uh, credits it as August 14th and one, another one August 15th. But, you know, we're kind of splitting hairs. But she um, made this purchase on Etsy. This is my favorite part. I just noticed this today. These rings were glow in the dark. They were glow in the dark malachite inlay titanium rings. Um, so you had the... Um, size four for Lori and a size 11 and a half for um, Chad. The, the person who would have been making the rings um, got busy with school and didn't have time to make the rings and uh, refunded their money at some point. Then October 2nd, this is the same day that Brandon Boudreaux was shot at. So while Alex was in uh, Gilbert, allegedly shooting at Brandon Boudreaux, Lori was shopping for, you guessed it, Malachite rings. And these are the rings that they actually landed on. Now, one thing that bothers me is... If, the only purchase we know of is this Malachite ring, but we know that there were other items purchased um, through Amazon. So uh, hope, I'm sure those will come out in the trial. But um, we know for sure that she bought hers <clears throat> that, um, and she used um, uh, Charles' credit card. All right, but you can see here, I mean, Malachi was so important to her that she was willing to settle for costume jewelry for her wedding ring. The, the grand total was $38.15. And so, I mean, this, this is just costume jewelry. That's how important Malachi was to her. So Lori was a princess. She had fairly sophisticated taste in some respects. She, you know, we also talked about like, you know, um, uh, like 
uh, shopping at Ross and, um, you know, discount stores like that. But she was such a chameleon. She may have just talked about that because I tended to be uh, more frugal. But, you know, she clearly had a beautiful home, beautiful cars, all of these nice things. And then she had this whatever Malachite ring. And I think that that speaks to just how important it was for Lori to have a Malachite ring, for both of them to have Malachite rings. Okay, so now we're going to... Um, talk a little bit about this group's beliefs about Malachite. Dr. Salerno touched on this a little bit, but I'm going to be enforcing that with some of the, um, the documents that she referenced. So as Dr. Salerno um, mentioned, um, according to Ian, now keep in mind, Ian was getting this information from Melanie. They were recently married. And a little bit of background on this document. Ian did not create this document out of the goodness of his heart. What had happened was he agreed to, actually, he offered to, um, to cooperate with police and, um, and then went back and he and his ex-wife, Natalie, went and talked to Rexburg police. And at this point, he was scared because Alex was still alive. And Melanie had said some things about, um, you know, creepy Uncle Al that really concerned Ian. Um, she had also talked allegedly about how uh, Ian told Natalie how, you know, kids can turn quickly, like they can be light one minute and then turn dark. So there were a number of things that really scared Ian. And so Ian was incentivized to partner with his ex-wife, Natalie, uh, to make sure that his kids were protected. And, um, and in fact, he even gave up his weekend, which was uh, before Christmas, the weekend before Christmas, and told Natalie to keep the kids <clears throat> because he was so concerned. I, or I think it was two weekends before Christmas. Anyway, so, um, so, he, so what he did was he, he had initially uh, opted to cooperate with the investigation, but then once Alex woke up dead, he was like, hey, the threat is gone. At least this is what I believe went on inside his mind. And he said, peace out, I'm not helping you guys anymore because it wasn't in his best interest. And then he tried to mend things um, with Melanie. And so they met with their attorneys and uh, Melanie's attorney told Ian that, hey, in order to you know, um, represent you, we need to know what you told the authorities. And so Ian wrote out these really comprehensive notes, including an outline, but he handed that laptop over to his ex-wife for one of his kids to use. And Natalie found these notes and bounced them over to Brandon, where they ended up in Brandon and Melanie's um, divorce documents. That's how we know about these documents. <clears throat> so in that outline, there was a part of it that talked about spiritual healing. And you see here, healing Malachite solution slash bomb. That's why Dr. Salerno was talking about the bomb. He was, she wasn't talking about a B-O-M-B, but a B-A-L-M. And that's why she had those cautions of like, you would never want to actually put Malachite in some kind of lotion and create a bomb with it is very, very dangerous. But according to Ian, uh, Melanie said that Malachite is said to have healing properties. Um, and it's administered by calling on it in a blessing. So tuck that idea of um, blessing away. 
Um, but before we talk about that, Ian also noted that their group, this is the Church of the Firstborn, so that was the name of their group, uh, is a higher organization in God's church and its truest form on earth, yada, yada, yada. But then we see down here, Chad and Lori's group specializes in healing and music. <laughs> so I would, um, I would challenge the music uh, specialization because we had a whole live about their Smule accounts and Melanie could not carry a tune if her life depended on it. Um, and neither could Alex, but Melanie uh, was especially um, tragic. Anyway, so, but I thought that that was interesting that, you know, Melanie at some point allegedly made this point to Chad that their particular group actually specialized in healing, especially, you know, given the, previous point about uh, Malachite being a healing bomb and administered by calling on it in a blessing. So where else have we heard about blessings? On December 10th, so this was two days before Alex died in Zulema's home that he shared with her, but that her son didn't no, she was married to Alex. Anyway, Alex asked Chad to give him a blessing because he was having a bad attack and couldn't breathe. <clears throat> the next day, Chad asked Alex how he was doing, and Alex responds that he is winded every time he stands up and has a resting pulse of 100. Now, you know, I, I'm going to be very curious to find out why Alex didn't ever seek out any. Alexa, stop. Um, any kind of medical care, uh, and I just, I, I just wonder. I'll, I'll put it this way. I wonder if, in Alex's reaching out to Chad, if Chad possibly convinced him that he shouldn't reach out to, um, to like any kind of um, doctor or call nine one one or or anything like that because his he was wanted potentially now uh it i think it was just like the 10th the december 9th or 10th it uh gilbert police had eyes on both alex and zulema so i don't know what they were waiting for but they were um, they, they were casing him, and so they, they could have brought him in. They didn't. Um, but anyway, uh, and but on the 11th, also at around just before noon, <clears throat> Alex to Chad, Alex said to Chad, I feel like the poison from the spear in the heart has done some residual damage. Okay, so just kind of tuck that away. Now, I also thought it was interesting. So, oops, um, this says on the morning of September 12th, but it's actually, it should be uh, December 12th. Alex was awake at about eight o'clock. Zulema needed to leave for work and she was worried about him and asked how he was feeling. He said he was fine and was feeling better. Uh, again, yeah, according to Zulema. Zulema left for work. Later in the day, Alex had a friend give him a blessing over the phone. She called Alex and he was having a hard time talking to her. So this is the day of his death. It says that uh, Alex had, um, uh, had a friend, and I believe that this was Chad, and there's another reference to that elsewhere. But anyway, she called Alex, and he was having a hard time talking to her. <clears throat> she told him she would drop off her client and come right home. She said she was in the area of Higley and Baseline and was not far from home. She then called her son, who was at home with Alex. She told him to go to her room and check on Alex. He stayed on the phone and checked on Alex. She could hear her son telling Alex to stay on the floor and not to try to get up. Zulema told her son to call 911. She arrived home and her son met her at the door and told her it was really bad. <clears throat> 
So I don't know if the, if he called Chad again on the day of his death, because we know that he asked Chad for a blessing on the 10th. So this was uh, December 10th. He had um, called Chad and asked him to give him a blessing. So I don't know if this is an, like he called him again the day he actually died, or if this is a reporting error. I think this came from his autopsy. Um, but anyway, um, there, there we have it. But guess where you can buy malachite? So these aren't like malachite stones like you buy in a ring. This is like raw malachite. There, you can read more about this and follow the link if you're so inclined. But it says malachite occurs worldwide, world, worldwide, including Congo. Um, anyway, Mexico. So, one thing that I just wonder about is Alex went to Mexico just five days prior to his death. Um, this was from an article. I forgot to drop the link to the article. I'll add that if I remember. Pastenis, so this is Zulema, went to the hospital and investigators found her sitting next to her husband's body. They asked to speak with her in another room. Zulema asked me why she was being questioned and if she was considered a suspect in the death of her husband, a detective wrote in his report. I assured her she was not a suspect, but I needed information from her regarding what happened at her house when Alex was discovered. According to Pastenis, Cox began having shortness of breath December 6, 2019. And the following day, Alex drove to Mexico to buy prescriptions because they were cheaper. Now, again, going back to the point that um, Dr. Salerno made, is Zulema claims that Alex was buying prescriptions, yet there were no uh, prescription drugs found in his system five days later. When he arrived home, he reportedly felt winded but refused to get medical attention. The day Cox died, he called a friend and received a priesthood blessing over the phone. EastIdahoNews.com can confirm from multiple sources this friend was Chad Daybell, who had married Cox's sister, Lori Daybell, a month earlier. Pestenis and Cox had known each other for about a year, according to the Pestenis. Um, uh, that's a typo. The couple eventually went on a trip to Las Vegas and eloped in a spur of the moment decision on November 29th, Pestenis told police. So my question is, if Alex's reference to this poison from the spear in the heart is a reference to Malachite, I just wonder if he actually went to Mexico to purchase Malachite and um, suspected that he hadn't been careful enough with it. Just, just a thought. Okay, fourth point. Did Melanie share Lori's interest in Malachite? This is Melanie, her niece. I would say so be for three reasons. One, Ian's information came from Melanie. We know that. Two, again, by way of reminder, Lori sent a screenshot of the Malachite stone to Melanie. We already went over this. So before she didn't even purchase that stone and before she even bought attempted to purchase her first Malachite ring, which was before <clears throat> um, Tammy was dead. Uh, Charles was dead, but Tammy hadn't died yet. But before she even purchased it, she first sent it the, a screenshot of it to Melanie. And then good old Melanie Kim also threw Melanie Pulowski under the bus in talking about her interest in Malachite. Let's listen to that. So, oh, um, also, this was an interview that she did in, I think, the Gilbert, Gilbert Police Station, maybe. 
or no, this is a Chandler police station, it says right here. Um, and this was on April 30th, 2021. So they circled back and met with different people from this group as well as um, Jason Mao, which is also someone from the group. Okay, so, and this is also the interview where uh, Melanie is really just kind of off the chain. So with these castings, and the first one you're involved in was that. Uh... And also they're talking about the castings. These were the castings where these different group members tried to claim that like, oh no, they were just trying to uh, cast evil spirits out of uh, these different victims for redemptive purposes. But we know from Melanie Gibb in this interview that these castings, these prayers were unto death, not unto salvation. And, um, and she also talked about that in her interview with Keith Morrison for Dateline. Okay. So let me take it back to the beginning. So with these castings, and the first one you're involved in was at uh, somebody's house. And I can't remember if they did it that night or the next day, or I don't remember, but it was. Was it still in somebody's house? Yeah, I think so. I'm okay. pretty sure. And that, was that just for Charles? Oh, absolutely, because that's the only person they knew had that, that issue at the time, according to their pretend revelation. They call it pretend because who knows what they're so listening to. Describe to me how, how, they, did it? how they did it. Okay, so they were trying to figure out first how to do it, and so they're all coming up with different ideas, and I, I wasn't familiar with their vernacular. They would say things like, you know, like Melanie would coin the phrase probably like, some kind of malachite or something after all like malachite's a gem mm -hmm. so they thought that gem had powers you know like in the chakra world people get into stones and stuff mm -hmm. like that they mm -hmm. kind of brought that into that okay <clears throat> so she throws melanie under the bus says she had this um that melanie talked about malachite all right so with there is no way around that. <clears throat> now, here I am really going to put on a tinfoil hat. I have talked about this before, um, but there was this really odd reference in the Gilbert police report that on December 9th, so this was three days before Alex's death. This is just to kind of put things in perspective. Early in the morning, um, someone was requested by Detective Pillar to respond to the Gilbert Police Main Station to assist with an assault investigation. I arrived at the location at approximately 7.20. The scene consisted of three residential trash cans located in the secured Main Station parking lot. Now, nowhere in the police report does it mention that a search warrant had been served uh, to collect trash cans, like residential trash cans. And so when I first read this, I was like, oh, I wonder, you know, what search warrant this will show up as, like whose house did they search to get these trash cans? And I made this point in a couple of different laws. I actually think that this is a little bit of a red herring. I strongly suspect these weren't actually trash cans, but trash bags that someone left out on the curb. If it's left out on the curb, then police can uh, collect bags of trash without a warrant. And that's what I suspect that these were. But what, so we don't know whose house these came from, but if I had to put money down on it, I would say Zulema's house <clears throat> because they were following Zulema and Alex. And um, anyway, okay. So um, the following is a brief description of the items collected. Item one, a teal colored hairbrush. It was located in one of the trash cans and it was given a property ID. Now, this was the only item from these three, well, I'll just say trash bags. I don't think that they were actually trash cans, but 
This was the only item that was admitted into evidence. Uh, the rest uh, were just photographs. Uh, so they basically just took these trash bags and spread them out on the floor and photographed them. But something made them, and it could, you know, I mean, you throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall and some of it sticks and some of it doesn't. So I don't want to put undue emphasis as I put undue emphasis on this teal colored hairbrush, but it is very much of a curiosity to me because it was the only thing collected. Um, so, so I, I, I think this was about maybe a year ago, I just did a random search for teal colored hairbrushes because I was just curious, you know, what I might find. Um, and I found this, I think this was on Amazon. I'm not exactly sure now because it was so long ago and I just saved the screenshot. It was a teal malachite hairbrush that was in, no, no, we don't know that this teal colored hairbrush was this hairbrush. It's just a curiosity that I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to throw it in here because it was part of my Malachite notes. So again, a little tinfoil hat, it's just more of a, mm, you know, like I'm going to just kind of have feelers out there during these trials to see what comes of this teal colored hairbrush, if anything. Okay, if you would um, like to dig into the presentation, you can do that by following uh, this bit.ly link. And on that note, um, we will dive into Q and A. We're probably not going to spend um, a really long time in Q and A. Um, I'm a little tired tonight, but uh, but I will take some questions. Um, and as always, uh, if you want to ask a question, one thing that helps your question stand out is just to put the word "question" in all caps. You don't have to put your entire question in all caps. It actually makes it a little more difficult to read. Um, also, uh, I generally don't ans answer really long questions because you know I made the mistake early in my lives of just reading questions live. And unless I know you, um, I'm not going to do that because sometimes the questions are off topic or you know just kind of intrusive. Um, so. Um, all right. Okay. So let's see if there are any questions. Uh, Denny asked, didn't Zulema call Alex to make a care package yet? It was a basket for a friend. Um, so it, we talked about that in another live. That was another just weird detail. Um, you know, like, I mean, Obviously, Alex was a total bro, and he wasn't even particularly sharp. So, well, you know, is it is it possible that he made some kind of gift basket for Zulema? Sure. Is it probable? I would say no. Um, and uh, it, it, just an, a note. Uh, putting psychic or medium in your name is not going to work in this chat. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it's just really distracting. It just feels like I just keep reading psychic medium. Um, so, uh, all right. Yeah, so uh, Terry asked, do you think Tammy could have died of the same thing as Alex? Yes, I do. Because someone had noted, and I think that um, this was, oh gosh, who, who was it? Um, Emma, I think it was Emma had noted to a coworker 
that there was pink foam that um, had been coming out of her mom's or was like, I guess probably on her face or something. So there, there was this pink foam and um, we know that I, I think, I think it's an established fact that Alex also had this, um, this frothing or this uh, pink foam. So <clears throat> uh, also there are two nurses that, um, that have a, a true crime podcast. And I thought it was interesting that they also talked about, you know, that um, it's just weird that pulmonary embolisms keep coming up in these deaths um, because they said that they're mostly seen, and I don't want to misquote them, but I think uh, sh they said that they're, they mostly see them in much older uh, people and people who have recently had surgery. And none of these people had just recently had surgery. And we know from Tammy's parents, her father was interviewed at one point, um, and it might have been by police. Um, but uh, Tammy would, well, we also know from Emma that Tammy was in a Zumba class. We also know that from Tammy's Zumba instructor. Uh, but um, Tammy was also taking a dance class and had demonstrated some of these dance moves and she was preparing for a 5K. So clearly she hadn't just recently had surgery. Um, but yeah, so, <clears throat> and we really don't know what uh, Joe died of because again, I didn't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but Dr. Salerno uh, echoed my concerns. I'm not saying she based her concerns on what I had said, but I kept like throwing this red flag on the fact that they never opened up Joe's body. If this, this autopsy was based on an external examination uh, as well as his medical records um, and, um, and the list of medications that he had in his medicine cabinet, as well as um, meds that were found um, in the toxicology report. Um, but when I was on the Nancy Grace show, um, I was, uh, there was also an ME, a medical examiner, um, uh, interviewed for that same podcast. And before we went live, I made the point that they didn't open up Joe's body, that it was based on an external examination alone. And he like stopped me and he was like, whoa, I didn't know this. And he made the point that if you don't open the person up, that's really not a legitimate uh, autopsy and that the absolute minimum um, they should have, the, the ME should have listed his uh, cause of death as unknown. So, um, <clears throat> you know, take that for what it's worth. So we really don't know Joe's actual cause of death. There was just a lot of hypothesis. Um, Dr. Salerno had also made the point that judging by the significant amount of what they call skin slippage, she said that she does not believe that Joe was in a moderate state of decomposition, as was noted in his, in the ME's report. She believed that he was um, uh, profoundly, his, his remains um, or his body was profoundly uh, decomposed. And that aligns with what the police report stated, which was that he was in an advanced state of decomposition, talked about this in another live, but um, uh, Janice also saw uh, <clears throat> some of these pictures that I didn't publish in the group. And you could tell that um, it appears that when they moved his body, he basically, his, his remains basically imploded. Um, you could tell by the state of the mattress. So we really don't know Joe's cause of death and there was no mention of um, foam, but we also don't know how long foam lasts. I would imagine by the, the fact that it's 
foam, it's um, going to be more effervescent and, um, and will diminish. So, um, yeah. All right. But so my, my point being, you know, the fact that there wasn't a legitimate, I, in my opinion, a legitimate autopsy done in Joe's death, then Tammy didn't have an autopsy until after she was already embalmed. And by then, you know, they, they basically take all the fluids of the body and extract them and replace them with um, embalming solutions. So a lot of the evidence is, is lost in the embalming process. Um, and, and then uh, with Alex, there's no reference to checking specifically for like the presence of any kind of poisoning, you know. So for all we know, these deaths could have all followed the, the same pathology. We just, we don't know, and we probably will never know. Um, Lisa P asked, how long does it take malachite to make someone sick? According to Dr. Salerno, it can either be immediate, um, like the, the little girl, the three-year-old who ingested the, I think it was called malachite green, <clears throat> excuse me, and nearly died of malachite poisoning. Uh, also much quicker with a malachite dust, um, or if if a bomb is put on the skin, um, according to so, in other words, if someone took malachite dust and mixed it in a lotion, um, that according to Dr. Salerno, that would um, could also cause a very uh, quick um, death, or it can be slower, just depending on. The, the form of the malachite and how much was um, taken in and how. So, um, yeah, uh, Lori1265 Bradley asks, is malachite in, in, in raw form able to be handled easily? Yes, yes. So um, we saw a, a picture of it. I mean, you know, here you go, like this is, he, they're just stones. So someone could just pick up the, the stone. Um, and, you know, like they could, um, you know, create a powder from it using like any kind of grinder and stuff. So, um, yeah, it is not very easy to get a hold of in the U S although I found sites where you could order it. Um, but yeah, um, okay. Yeah, so Martian Planet Art uh, asked, is this kind of stream of consciousness, spirit of the heart, paintball gun incident, wind direction, gun didn't fire per se, but maybe sprayed Tammy? Mm -hmm. Possibly, I, I think that that, I, I, I think that the plan was for Tammy to be shot. I personally suspect that uh, Alex's gun may have misfired because he had it in the storage unit. So, and it might not have been as climate controlled as he had thought. Um, so we do know that uh, Nate Eaton from East Idaho News made a reference to, um, like it, it, he listed out some of the things that um, uh, Alex uh, or, and uh, Alex, Lori and Chad took back and forth from the storage unit, uh, you know, like putting it in the storage unit, removing it from the storage unit and one of the items was a gun case. And there was um, something that looked like a gun case in uh, uh, one of the surveillance videos. So, um, and yeah, anyway. Um, so I, I think that the plan was definitely for Alex to shoot Tammy, uh, but then, 
it, it appears the gun misfired and um, and so they had to go with plan B. So I don't think that Alex would have, you know, risked um, handling malachite to like, because if he threw malachite powder or dust into the air, he also um, risked um, taking it in himself. And she didn't say anything about, uh, well, he had a ski mask on, but uh, that's not enough to protect against malachite. Okay. Um, Uh, Karen asked, do you think Zulema could have used the Malachite bomb on Alex in an intimate massage? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yes. Yes, I do. I, I, my personal opinion is that Alex was murdered um, in the Reddit email. Uh, whoever wrote that was clearly an insider. I've made this point in a couple of different lives now, maybe several, <clears throat> but I try not to operate under the assumption that someone watching one of my lives will have seen any of the other lives, but, um, uh, what was, where, where was I going with that? Um, I forget. I forget where I was going. But anyway, yes, yes. I oh, um, yeah. I oh. So we know from the Reddit email that Alex um, was also ultimately deemed a zombie, and so no good deed goes unpunished. And so I do think that he was expelled. I. Um, I also strongly suspect that the bag of money that Zulema referenced, um, which was highly suspect in my opinion, um, was quite possibly payment um, for the dirty deed. And I also made this point in another live that it, it was clear from an interaction between Zulema and Lori that this was an arranged marriage that Zulema and Alex's marriage, because early on, Lori had cautioned that these women in her group, so her little acolytes, um, be careful what they say to Alex because he was only like basically a one wifer. He was only a one probation, um, you know, so kind of a lower being. He hadn't, you know, uh, been a multiple probation being like Zulema, Lori, <clears throat> um, the, both Melanie's, Chad, etc. Later on, um, when Lori brings up Alex to Zulema, lo and behold, he was a multiple probation being. And but at one point, Zulema actually asks Lori point blank. Um, you know, sometimes I can be kind of slow. Were you saying that you think that God wants um, Alex and me to marry? Um, um, and so Lori was like, oh, just, you know, pray about it and, you know, yada, yada. So, um, so yeah. And, and they didn't even exchange phone numbers until after Charles murder. And I think it was in... August, maybe. Um, so, I mean, it was just like a few months before they were married, because uh, if my, no, I know that my redactions are correct, because I found the entire police report unredacted in the Chandler um, police report. So, or I found the entire affidavit of probable cause in the Chandler police report. But, um, but Alex texted Zulema and said, hey, Zulema, this is Alex, <laughs> you know, so, and I'm pretty sure that happened in, um, in August. Um, whenever it was, it was, um, yeah, it, it was just a few months before they actually married. So um, Melanie Polowski's reference to, you know, like Zulema is just trying to grieve the death of her husband. You know, I'm like, mm, probably not. Um, but 
All right. Um, let me let me see if I can find that. Uh, I'll just look really quickly now. Um, see it yeah but I'm pretty sure it, it was sometime in August it doesn't matter I'm fixating on something that's not important all right um Yes, Melanie. According to, I mean, she asked, Alex was a zombie. And yes, um, according to the, the Reddit email. And I made this point multiple times in other lives, but there were details that we had access to from this email that it was originally published, uh, I think, on like a a, um, like a, a subreddit for like former LDS members. Um, and then it was removed, but someone had grabbed a screenshot and, um, and republished it. So, um, but early on, a lot of these details hadn't come out yet. And so bit by bit, a lot of these details ended up like, you know, coming out in interviews and, um, and also ultimately some of these FOIA docs. <clears throat> so not everything proved to necessarily be accurate, but um, the, the vast majority of it was. So accurate enough to confirm that whoever wrote this, e this original email was some kind of an insider. My money would be on David Warwick because the person was close enough to know the details, but like there was um, someone's name, I think, uh, and it was, I think it was, um, it was one of Charles Zombie names. Um, I think it was Hiplos, and it was like very close in a, in the Reddit email. Um, anyway, okay. Uh, Myrna asks, is there a police inventory of items found in the storage unit? Not that I know of. So the only way that we know what was in the storage unit was from the, the video that East Idaho News showed. But they also only showed um, like blurbs of the video and um and the video was at some point edited because the original video according to my memory also had like um some officers from rexburg police but the video that's up there now that part isn't in the video and um, so it might have been at the uh, request of Rexburg police not to include too many details. So there are just like these snippets, but also the, so, but Rexburg police didn't collect the items that were left behind in the storage unit. And, um, and the owner of the storage unit who was a, was just, I mean, like, oh my gosh, if if any of the Phoenix area police had his attention to detail, he kept a whiteboard where he wrote out all of the times that someone came in to the, the storage unit and left and made notes of what kind of car it was and... Um, and the times and and stuff and the the dates and the times and um so yeah uh, but but that's that's all we have and um he ultimately uh discarded the the items so i know at one point when the woodcocks went out there they looked at uh, a thrift store to see if they could find any of jj's items um but 
as far as I know, uh, none of it was recovered and, uh, and at least the stuff that was shown in the video <clears throat> that we saw on the East Idaho News website as well as Dateline, um, that stuff wasn't collected, that was left behind. So um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Denny asked, didn't Alex die within days of Tammy's exhumation? Uh, yes. I personally don't believe that he, if he was murdered, and I do believe he was murdered, I personally don't think that it was tied to Tammy's, uh, to Tammy's body being exhumed. And the reason for that is that uh, Chad, made, uh, Ian made a reference that um, Chad thought that the police were just trying to scare him. That the, it, somehow it got back to him that um, Tammy's body was going to be exhumed, but he had told Melanie and Ian heard this, that he just thought that like the police were just trying to scare him, but her body had already been exhumed at, at that time because Ian made note of that, you know, and, um, and her body was exhumed and reburied the same day, like within hours. Um, so I just, I, I personally suspect, so I originally thought that it was tied to Tammy's body being exhumed until some of these FOIA docs came out. But I personally suspect that Alex was just too much of a risk. You know, he, he was pretty um, low intelligence and he had some impulse control issues. We know that according to um, Zach Cox, uh, Alex had mentioned to a bishop that Lori saw um, and Jesus face to face and had a conversation with him. And this angered Lori. She didn't want the bishop to know about this. And, um, and uh, Zach had talked about how he was just a really strange guy. Um, but then also there were just too many hands in the pot. So I know just from watching, I know we, from watching true crime, one of the things that uh, has been talked about in multiple shows is that we, the more people who are involved in any kind of murder plot, the higher risk. I mean, obviously this is common sense, the, but it's easier to break someone because they can just work. You have, uh, you know, a, a triangle. They could work Lori, Chan, and Alex at the same time. They could tell Alex that, you know, Lori was already talking or Chad was already talking and peeing his pants or, you know, whatever. I mean, they can say whatever they want. And, um, and Alex, obviously he knew too much. He was the family hitman allegedly. And, um, and so, yeah, but I, I think that Alex, if he was murdered, I think it was more because he was one, he, you know, he was, he was just too difficult to control. In some ways, he was very easy to control um, because all Chad had to do was just keep blessing him. And we, and now Zulema had said that when Alex read uh, Chad's patriarchal blessing, I think that's what it's called, um, that he cried like a baby or blubbered like a baby, something like that. And, um, but I do think it, you know, so I thought mm, maybe, maybe not, but I do think it was significant that he printed it out and they found a copy of this patriarchal blessing printed out and in Alex's truck when they, um, <clears throat> when they collected his truck. So to me, that communicates that this this patriarchal blessing was important to him. And just today I had noticed, um, I didn't touch on it in the live um, because again, you know, I don't want to get too off topic, but 
who cares in the Q&A. Um, but Summer had also made a reference. Um, uh, I think it was, yeah. Um, okay, let me share my, my screen here. I just thought that this was really interesting and I hadn't noticed it before. Okay, so hopefully you see my screen. Summer also talked about the relationship between Alex and Charles. She indicated that Alex was very close to Charles. They even hung out on the weekends. Summer recalled seeing Charles' final will and testament after he died. In this document, Charles stated that he wanted to be cremated and he did not want to have a service. Okay, Summer, whatever. Charles mentioned four friends in this document and Alex was one of them. Again, these, I, I would take this with a major grain of salt just for the fact that this is a member of the Cox family uh, sharing this. But uh, according to Kay and Larry, uh, Charles was very concerned about Alex. And we also know that just two weeks before Alex, I mean, before Charles was murdered, Lori said to him in an argument, okay, Joe Ryan. And, you know, I made this point in another line, but I believe that was a shot across the bow um, for Charles. And I think that that would have struck considerable fear in his heart because I think that Charles um, knew about the 2007 plan to uh, murder Joe. I, I strongly suspect that, but I talked about that in another live. Okay, so um, Summer indicated that this relationship between Alex and Charles obviously changed when Lori left Charles in January. Well, he I mean, the, now we're supposed to believe that Charles didn't update his will um, since in between January and July. But we know that he changed the um, the beneficiary of his life insurance policy. So was Alex still mentioned in his will? Hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I would call BS on that, maybe, but... Um, Anyway, Summer told investigators that Alex was excommunicated from the church twice because he could not live by the standards of the church. Alex had a difficult time with sexual behaviors. Uh, Summer even knew that because of this addiction, he went to South America a couple of times. It was more than a couple of times to look for his, quote, future wife. Mm, again, not according to Adam. He wasn't looking for his future wife. However, a couple of years before his death, Alex became devoted to the church again and wanted to be rebaptized. Now, keep in mind, we know from Lori's weirdo smule recording of the song Hallelujah, she had rewritten the words. We, well, at least, we strongly suspect that this would have been Lori re who rewrote the the lyrics. It could have been Chad, but. Uh, no, actually, she hadn't met Chad at that point. This was in 2017. I think it was like October or November November of 2017. So this was before uh, Joe even died. But, um, but she talked about how like the darkness left and stuff. You can check out that live. Uh, but so... Um, and so Alex became devoted to the church again and wanted to be rebaptized. Summer mentioned the patriarchal blessing that was given to Alex, and she stated that Alex felt like he was out of the darkness now, which was straight from Lori's song that she sang on Smeal. So really, really bizarre stuff. But again, I, I believe just an indicator to me that Alex had become useful to Lori again. <clears throat> Colby had also mentioned in his interview with, uh, I believe it was Gilbert Police, that um, Alex started hanging around again, he estimated in January, 2018. So Lori sings this song 
in like October, November 2017, Colby takes note that now Alex is hanging around again, which uh, operates under the assumption that he wasn't hanging around before. Um, and then if you look at the lyrics from that song, which is published in the group, but I, there's also a live that I did specifically just about the Smule account. And if you want to jump to a particular topic in a live, I have jump links in the description. So it's very easy to jump ahead. Basically, it, you know, anytime I include um, a minute mark, that becomes a link to that particular minute mark of the video. So whether you're on mobile or desktop, if you're on desktop, you can click on it. If you're on mobile, you can um, tap on it and it will advance the video to that point. Okay, so yeah, but that song now is particularly compelling because I think it tells the story of uh, Lori, I suspect, this is just my opinion, um, that she had murder on her mind. Um, and if my suspicions are correct, she would need both of the fathers out of the way. Um, so who knows? Um, but I do, I do believe, I, at least I strongly suspect, actually believe, that Lori targeted Chad. Um, Okay. Yeah, uh, Jennifer Ray made the point, none of her family has even showed up in court for her. I will be very surprised if any of Lori's family, like <clears throat> her parents, siblings, I'll be very surprised if any of them show up for the trial. Um, Jackpot Betty asked, do you know who visits Lori in jail? Um, so they don't have in-person visits at her jail. Um, it's all done um, online through an app. And she has, I think, an iPad. I, I think both she and Chad have iPads, and that's how they meet with people. So, um, yeah, so we, we don't. We don't know everyone who is talking to her. Um, T.S. Jackson asked, do you think they were afraid Alex would talk slash brag? <clears throat> I don't, I, I think both were probably concerns. I think the bigger concern would be that he would talk, um, that they would let him know that you know, the death penalty was on the table, which ultimately now it is, and that he would sing like a canary. Okay, I'll take a couple more questions. Um, thank you, Terry. Um, <laughs> Not a reference to my glasses. Uh, okay, I'm mostly seeing comments. So, um, all right, Kim Schmidt. Kim is one of the eagle eyes in the group. So I don't even have to read her question ahead of time. If Malachite is in the bodily fluids, is that dangerous to those that come in immediate contact with the bottle, with the body fluids? Maybe a reason for the six hours del delay with Tammy and JJ being wrapped. Um, that's a that's a good question. I I don't know. I mean, I I mm, if I understand Dr. Salerno's point about these copper. Um, compounds uh, competing with uh, oxygen in the blood system, it sounds like they would have to 
come it's like like it sounds like this all happens in the 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 blood system like it could you know be throwing clots and stuff like that so it sounds like kind of more of an internal wrecking ball and not so much like something that could then be uh, transmitted through like coughing or you know throwing up or you know even contact with blood i i would imagine <clears throat> it would be um pretty diluted by that point so i would my, you know, if I had to put money down, I would say probably not. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that the, you know, the the characters involved in all this, I think that they did significant research in some things, like you see Chad researching before Tylee was buried. Um, the direction of the wind uh, for that particular day. So you see them doing research, you know, for a particular topics. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if they hadn't done significant research into Malachite. And I uh, strongly suspect Lori needed Malachite rings as a trophy. Um, and I talked in one of my analytics uh, lives, videos about um, uh, other evidences of Lori keeping trophies, like the, the pictures of the kids right before they were allegedly murdered. <clears throat> well, we know they were murdered. Um, and, um, and what else? There was something else that she had kept, and I can't think of uh, what it was now, but um, so I s strongly suspect the Malachite rings were a trophy. And then, you know, the question remains, why would it be a trophy? Why was she so hyper-focused on Malachite? I think it played a very significant role in this, in this group's MO. Um, because Melanie and Ian had just been married. Now, we don't know if Ian was a part of this group. We don't know when Melanie and Ian, you know, actually um, met when they started dating. I mean, Melanie and Ian's story is it just happens to be the day after her um, her divorce was finalized. So um, but, you know, I'm sure she didn't. Well, I don't, I can't say, I'm sure. Um, I think she told him a lot. And I talked, I think maybe in my last live about, I suspect that Ian's motivation was financial because we know that uh, uh, Brandon had paid Melanie $300,000. And that was before their divorce was even finalized. And I think that came from the proceeds of their house sale, um, as well as her half in the businesses. Um, so, you know, that, that was a lot of money for Ian. Um, and so that's, I, I yeah, that's, that's what I think Ian got out of this. Um, but I'm I would imagine that 300,000 is gone. And now he has a lifetime of being tethered to this case. Um, Kimby asked, do you think Zulema administered poison to Alex, believing it was a cure or treatment to make him well. She might well have been in, in shock in the hospital, and that's why she lawyered up so fast. Nope. No, I absolutely do not believe any of that. Um, I, I think Zulema would have known exactly what she was doing. Um, again, this is my opinion. But, you know, Alex was her sixth husband. Not that I'm trying to make a judgment on people who have multiple marriages. I'm not. <clears throat> I'm just saying, like, she hardly knew this guy. She didn't have respect for him. We know that 
he contacted, uh, according to the FBI's notes, he had uh, called um, a Hispanic female the day that he shot at Brandon. So I think they were two peas in a pod. I do strongly suspect that Zulema was the Hispanic female. And we know that he made um, a payment to this same Hispanic female who he talked with on the day of uh, Brandon's um, shooting. And in fact, I think I think it might have been like right before the shooting. It it made there I, there was there was some reference to it. Like anyway, but it was um, if memory serves me, it was the day of the shooting. <clears throat> so I think that Zulema is in this up to her yeah. elbows. Um, and you know, the, it, I mean, she was in it enough to want to agree to an immunity. Uh, a limited use immunity deal. Um, so clearly she carried, well, I can't say clearly, it, that would uh, suggest that uh, she carries some culpability in these, these crimes, um, in at least one of these crimes. But um, yeah, so no. And also keep in mind with Zulema, the, in my opinion, she was the one who really kind of kicked this into the far left lane. It was right before, not, not, no, it might not have been right before Charles was killed, but it was pretty, uh, it was at least like within a few months of Charles being killed. She sends Lori a text letting her know that she had like this revelation prophecy that um, uh, a member or members of her family were going to die. Now, Lori kept blowing her off, <clears throat> excuse me, and, but when she sent that, oh, okay, it was May 2nd. So this was right before Lori saved the screenshot of Amalekite Stone, just a, a few days before um, uh, Zulema predicted in a text to Lori that, quote, something may happen to one of her family members. And that got Lori's attention. And she replied enthusiastically, call me with multiple exclamation marks. Um, so, uh, yeah. And then Zulema later talked about how she would, like, carry JJ's spirit um, like to heaven and like protect it. And, you know, so, I mean, she really ingratiated herself to Lori and got in the middle of all of this. And then right before Charles was killed, she like sent a text to Lori saying, are you sure he can't be turned back to the light? And then, you know, Lori kind of ghosts uh, Zulema, but I think at that point, Zulema just wanted to have something in writing, like, hey, I pumped the brakes, you know, but, you know, never, it, like, Zulema never came forward that we know of on her own, um, and never attempted to intervene, in, in, you know, for the, on behalf of the other people who she knew were also being targeted. And in fact, we found out from the FOIA docs that she visited Lori and Chad, didn't stay with Lori, but visited Lori and Chad in Rexburg in between Tylee and JJ's murders. So, you know, she, yeah, I mean, she, she was just, she was in it to win it. So <clears throat> no, she does not earn any benefit of the doubt. Okay, one more question, and then I am going to bed. Um, okay, Moonlight View asked, Annie, is is it fact that the day Alex died, they were, um, they were, uh, I think she meant investigators were looking into the case. Uh, I feel like they said law enforcement was in Arizona on that date. Um, Thank you. 
So, yeah, I mean, these people were being investigated by multiple, <clears throat> excuse me, police departments. So I talked in one of the lives about, I think one of the strangest details was I'm trying to remember when it was, but while Lori and Chad were on their honeymoon, um, so this would have been around like November 5th. Um, they like came and took the Jeep and there's like no reference that we know of where like anyone raises any kind of red flag about this. So uh, they were, uh, I think it was, yeah, Gilbert had asked um, Rexburg police to be looking for this Jeep Wrangler because they've had it in CCTV um, on the day of Brandon's shooting. They also have uh, surveillance video of specifically Alex driving the Jeep. I think it was the day before Brandon was shot at um, just outside of Phoenix. And so Rexburg police was looking for the Jeep. I think they found it like the very end of October, maybe October 30th, 31st. So there was a lot going on uh, during this time because that was also when Melanie uh, Pulowski or then Boudreaux was moving um, up to Rexburg. I think they arrived November 1st. They left October 31st. I think the Rexburg police found the Jeep on like the 30th or 31st, something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, and then they impounded it on November 4th. Uh, they, they made a note that no one came to the door. So they just towed the Jeep away and left the, the warrant. But it's absolutely bizarre to me that they didn't take off at that point. Like, you know, like, what, what was that about? Like, you know, it was like more than two weeks later, they were still there the day of the, the welfare check. And so um, clearly, I mean, they're, they're and then... Um, we also know that uh, someone from Fremont County, I think this was in October, um, one of the, someone from the sheriff's office noted that um, uh, Chad and Lori were holding hands. Um, no, that was November 1st. So this is like right in this, like, there's just like this cluster of, act, of activity among these different departments and the FBI weren't involved yet, but you know, there were like requests kind of going back and forth. And so, <clears throat> so um, Lieutenant Powell was the one who observed uh, Chad and Lori holding hands in a romantic manner that was on November 1st. And these, all of these details are in my timeline where you can, you know, see everything broken down. So, I mean, there's just so much going on. So that was November 1st, then November uh, 3rd, I think was when, yeah, Lori and Chad um, left for Hawaii for their, you know, wedding and, um, and very brief honeymoon but they didn't stay there for some reason. And um, yeah, and so I don't know, there were, you know, there was just a lot of activity, but it, it appears that it wasn't really tightly coordinated until the FBI got involved. And, um, and I think they just kind of, you know, like, they, they were like the, the glue that um, appeared to kind of help this investigation take form and, and stick together. So that, I, and I, I'm basing that on just the myriad of emails from one of the agents in particular. 
uh, who was like coordinating phone calls and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, so yeah, there, there was a lot going on, um, in October and November. And we also know that originally Gilbert, uh, I'm going to keep pounding this drum because Tylee is my niece, you know, and this is my life. But um, but originally, Gilbert wanted to know the whereabouts of Tylee and Tylee's Jeep. Well, then Rexburg police, you know, let them know, hey, we found the Jeep and no one ever followed up about Tylee. It was like, oh, OK, well, we have the, the Jeep, you know, and so, yeah, so. Um, you know, I, I will say, as I always do, I have the deepest admiration for uh, law enforcement in Idaho. I think, you know, once, um, you know, once the welfare check was done and even before the welfare check was done, I mean, we know that Detective Hermosillo was uh, performing surveillance on um, Lori and um, Melanie. They came to someone from Rexburg police came to Melanie's door um, right after she had moved because Melanie had complained about that. Um, and yeah, so there, there was, there was a lot going on, but, and I really feel like, you know, the, and we don't have very much information from Idaho because Idaho treats um, the Freedom of Information Act very differently from Arizona. Um, but I, yeah, I do not. I mean, I do think ironically, like that the investigation that Gilbert police did into Brandon's uh, attempted shooting or the shooting, the attempted murder, <clears throat> was actually very comprehensive in a lot of ways uh, because they did like significant canvassing of the neighborhood. I was surprised by how many references there were to neighbors they talked to or knocked on their door, um, asked for, you know, like um, ring doorbell footage and, and things like that because there is not a single reference in the entire Chandler police report to Chandler ever interviewing a neighbor. And I mean, I searched for neighbor, I searched for ring, you know, for like, you know, ring um, like doorbell footage. And we also saw video footage of a neighbor actually coming up and approaching one of the investigators to talk to him and the investigator just blew him off. He was pretty brusque and was like, who are you? Who are you? And then was like, no, you know, we're good. We got this. And, um, and so, so, you know, my, by way of comparison, uh, uh, Gilbert did a much more comprehensive uh, investigation into the attempted murder of Brandon, while at the same time, you see things like, you know, again, all the caveats apply. I have no training in law enforcement, <clears throat> but um, they brought Melanie in for an interview and she brought her toddler and, you know, and to my memory, that was the only time they brought her in for an interview. I think she called um, angry about uh, Brandon um, taking the kids from school early because she was supposed to have them that day. But, um, but yeah, the, that was just particularly about that issue. Um, but I think they only interviewed her one time and um, yeah, I doubt they offer any kind of babysitting services. So it sounds from the police report, like she was just in the room with a toddler, which you know, and uh, knowing the Cox family MO, I think that was very much by design. Melanie, like, oh, oh, you know, be careful what you say because I have this two year old, you know, sitting in my lap or running around the room or whatever. So, anyway, um, yeah. Okay. All right. On that note, I'm going to call it a night um, next Friday.
Um, we will have a live Q&A where you can come with more questions and that's not limited to a particular topic. What I do in those lives is I just read off the questions. I don't know the questions ahead of time. And I just have like my timeline and the FOIA docs um, up and try to find references as you know, quickly as, as possible um, and reference them uh, whenever I can in the live. So, and you guys always come prepared with very good questions. So um, I will see you Friday night. Good night.